All right, everyone. Welcome back to week seven of Intro to SEO 2022. Thanks a lot for joining us again. Today, we will discuss the detection of exoplanets using radio velocity method. And this will be the last technical section of the workshop. However, we believe uh, it will showcase the very important skill of model fitting in astronomy. We will then review uh, the reading from last week uh, on direct imaging of exoplanets. Finally, we'll introduce you to the final project for this workshop, where you'll combine all the different skills you have picked up and apply them to writing your very first research proposal. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them here on YouTube or on piazza.com. All right, without further ado, let's move on to the first topic today, the radio velocity method and the red valve Python package. Our first speaker is Joey. Hey everyone, yeah, thanks Faye. I'm happy to be here with you. And let me just share my screen and we'll get right into it. So yeah, um, my name is Joey Murphy. I am, um, I am a rising fourth year graduate student at UC Santa Cruz where I work with Natalie Batalia uh, doing uh, radio velocity follow-up observations of transiting exoplanets discovered by NASA's TESS uh, spacecraft. Um, and I do a lot of this work with Faye, actually, too. And uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the radial velocity technique, sort of in general. Um, what does it mean when, when you hear people that do exoplanet research talk about uh, radial velocities or RV analysis and why it's useful? I'll talk about some of the technical tools that we'll need uh, to have sort of a familiarity with in order to uh, make radial velocity observations useful. And uh, through all of this, I'll be introducing you to this RADVEL um, Python package, which is a code base that you can use to analyze radial velocity observations. Okay, so, um, I'm not going to go through, uh, as we go through this uh, notebook, this Jupyter notebook, um, there will be spots where you can sort of fill in the blank. And we'll go through the kind of uh, outline of this notebook and, and work some of the examples. Um, but I'll leave some of those fill in the blanks empty for you to maybe try on your own. So, yeah. First of all, what, what do we mean when we say uh, radial velocity or uh, the radial velocity technique or method? So there are a handful of um, introductory resources here that I really encourage you to go and check out. Um, anywhere from you know, a more formal kind of white paper uh, to give you an introduction onto the radial velocity technique. Um, also, we have, we have resources for some of the technical tools that we'll talk about, like periodic gram analysis and also uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for error estimation. Um, but just get back to the scientific picture of like, what, what do we mean when we're talking about radial velocities? Um, so this is a very useful uh, GIF that I think is painting the picture for us. So if we look on the left panel, look at the left panel of this GIF, um, imagine we're staring at a star uh, with our telescope. So here's our telescope. We're looking at the star that's far away. Um, and say that star has a planet orbiting around it. Maybe we know there's a planet there because we saw the planet in transit from a telescope like TESS. Well, just as that star tugs on the planet with its uh, large amount of gravity that the star has, that planet will tug on the star. And because the star is much more massive than the planet, the tug that the planet uh, exerts on the star won't make it move as much as, you know, the planet orbits around the star, but both these objects are orbiting around the center of mass of the system. So what that means is that this star is actually wobbling a little bit back and forth as the planet tugs on it. And so uh, if we observe this star with a telescope, uh, what happens is that wobble in the top right panel here, that wobble is being illustrated as the velocity of the star following this sinusoidal pattern over time. At some point, its velocity will seem that it's moving towards us, and sometimes the velocity 
of the star will be moving away from us. And observationally, what that means is just like an ambulance uh, might sound, its siren might sound higher pitched when it's moving towards you on the street than it, when it's moving away from you, um, the Doppler effect will change the color of the starlight as we observe it. So just as this star is following this sinusoidal track in velocity, as it moves towards us, just like the ambulance, the uh, star's starlight will be blue shifted. It will be shifted towards higher frequency, like the ambulance sounds higher pitched when it's coming at us. And as it's traveling away from us, the, the star's spectrum will look uh, red shifted, or it will be moved towards uh, lower frequency or longer wavelengths. And so we can detect this shifting of the light in various spectral lines in the star. And by measuring that wobble, you can measure the mass of the planet. Because you can imagine a bigger planet, a more massive planet will induce a bigger wobble. Okay, cool. So that is like the, the five minute, the two minute uh, introduction on why radial velocities, um, what, well, what they are, uh, how we uh, make use of the observations and why they're important. You can measure the mass of an exoplanet by using this radial velocity technique. And if you do it for transiting exoplanets, then that's very powerful because now you have the radius of the exoplanet, how big it is, and you know how massive it is. So you can start to piece together, is this planet uh, dense, as dense as the Earth? Is this planet uh, very low density, like Jupiter or Saturn? Um, and you can start to, you know, snowball that into a million other questions about planet formation and evolution that we won't get into today. But um, that's the gist. We're, we're using these observations to measure planet masses. Okay, so um, that's sort of the scientific motivation for you. Uh, but moving on to RADVEL and some of the actual techniques we'll be using, um, we're going to first, I mentioned RADVEL is a Python package that you can use to analyze these radial velocity data. Um, and so we'll go through in this Jupyter notebook all the way from installing RADVEL to testing it out on an exoplanet system with real data. So um, let's just skip right down to it. Uh, the install, I, I already have this installed on my machine, but um, it should be fairly straightforward. I would recommend you create a virtual environment, maybe a new virtual environment um, before you install uh, RADVEL, but you can install it uh, from the command line uh, using pip. You could also git clone the RADVEL repository um, from GitHub. That, you know, that would give you the most up-to-date version of the code. Um, but however, however you want to install it, um, Give that a shot once uh, you're done watching this video. It should be fairly straightforward. There's some helpful uh, information on uh, the RADVEL GitHub itself. Uh, we're just going to make some um, uh, imports here. Now we're also going to uh, get our hands on some actual data, right? We made those observations of uh, a star spectrum and how it uh, is red shifted and then blue shifted. And we translate those red and blue shifts into a velocity, just like we saw here. We're trying to measure this curve over time. Okay, so what does this data actually look like? Well, Radvel, once we install it, actually comes with a little bit of data itself. So um, if we look at some of the data that Radvel has um, come along with, we'll see that it's in. Uh, a nice and orderly um, data frame for us. Uh, it looks like we have, by printing out the columns of that uh, data frame object, this panda, we're using pandas to read in a CSV file. Um, we can see that the uh, data here comes in, we have uh, three columns mainly. It's uh, the air bell, T and Vel. Okay, so um, that's not super useful without a header to explain what the columns actually mean. But for our purposes, this is just the error on the velocity measurement that we made. 
the time in some sort of, uh, this is Julian day minus some sort of offset uh, and the velocity in meters per second of the star. And what we can do is uh, using our matplotlib skills, our panda skills, uh, we can just plot that data here. Um, this is just a time series. Uh, I'll, I'll leave some of these uh, matplotlib little exercises for you to do as well. Um, but yeah, here is essentially uh, that data. It doesn't look as perfect and clean as this cartoon, but there's something here. There's something going up and down, it seems like. Um, and you can see the x-axis is in time and the y-axis is in meters, is in velocity in meters per second. Okay, so now we have some radial velocity data. What are some of the first things uh, we should try to do? Um, when we're looking at it, right? Um, is there a planet there? Uh, if so, what's the orbital period of that planet? Uh, how many planets are there? Uh, how large is the planetary signal going to be? We don't know these things a priori. Um, in some special cases, we might actually know about the planet's period from, say, a transit. But before we use any external information, one thing we can do is a periodogram analysis. And this is very important. Uh, uh, periodograms are a, um, they are a very, can be a very complicated topic. Um, we also might hear uh, this sort of analysis referred to as Fourier analysis. Um, essentially, you're looking at time series data and trying to pick out periodic uh, or quasi-periodic signals in the data. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, some of you may, may be sort of familiar with this technique before, but um, we can use what's called a periodogram to look for periodic signals in our data. And how that works is if we look at this cartoon, imagine that um, on the left here, this red line is our time series data. And behind it, these three sine waves of different periods are say the underlying signal that if we sum across, if we sum up all these three signals, we'll get the red line. And so this could be like the radial velocity data that we observed right here. Maybe there's some complicated process. Maybe there's one planet, two planet, three, three planets that add together um, to create this uh, kind of confusing looking signal that we see here. Well, the way a periodogram works is it's going to decompose this signal into a sum of a bunch of different sine waves at different frequencies or at different periods. And in that spectrum of sine waves, in that uh, collection, that series of sine waves at different periods and different frequencies, uh, you will see a spike in the coefficient of a periodic term when it contributes a lot of information to the underlying signal. So I guess so what that means is um, on the right here, once we make the Fourier transform of this signal, we will see spikes at the specific periods that are making up uh, the composite signal of our data. So yeah, it might be, uh, I know Fourier transforms are still a little, uh, magical to me, <laughs> even even after all these years. Um, so I would actually, I would highly recommend um, if it's been a while since you've uh, thought about Fourier transforms or uh, Fourier analysis, time series analysis, FET actually has this great um, online simulation where you can add uh, different sine waves together of varying amplitudes and see what kind of uh, some signal you get out. Um, so that might help you build some intuition there. Okay, so we're going to use this uh, tool, a, a periodogram, in this case, it's called a Lohm-Scargill periodogram, uh, based on the, the people that invented this specific technique. So the first thing we do, this might be a good first step when you're looking at a, a radial velocity data set, is to just make a periodogram of the data. And if there are any giant spikes, uh, in the, the 
uh, periodogram that you get out, that might be an indication that there is a strong periodic signal at that frequency, um, which in our case might be a planet. So we have this little function that we, we've used, uh, we're going to use to generate a periodogram. Uh, I'm going to search, let's just say we'll search uh, for periodic signals between five and to start, let's say, let's make it a thousand days, okay? I'm going to uh, create my lomps Virgil periodogram with my uh, data. I'm gonna tell it the minimum and maximum periods I want to search through. Um, and for the maximum period, I want to plot a line and label it um, with this label to tell me what is the, what peak do I see in the, in the data? Okay. And if I do that, uh, it looks like there is a peak at about 20-ish days. Okay. Uh, it's a whole other business of determining um, is that peak, is this peak more significant than this one? Uh, what's also what's going on over here? What about these small peaks? Do they matter? Do they not matter? Um, that's, that's something we um, probably don't have time for today, but for uh, in, in the interest of just uh, charging ahead, let's let's just zoom in a little bit. Okay, now I've set the max period to 100 days. It looks like there is this peak, yeah, at about 20 days still. So maybe that's where our first planet um, is hiding. Okay, so what do we do from here? We've, we've used some periodogram analysis to identify what we think might be a periodic signal in our radial velocity data. Now is when, uh, this is when Radbell comes into the picture. So Radbell, uh, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, uh, Radbell is a great, great module for uh, kind of cleaning up, making sense uh, of all of your radial velocity analysis. Um, Radbell in particular centers around some objects called uh, Radbell parameters and models. And so what we're going to do is just build our model object and give it a bunch of different parameters. Um, these parameters will include, uh, for example, for one planet, here are some of the parameters you might be using, the period of the planet. That's important. That's like what we just tried to find out here, like 20-ish days. Um, also, TC, or the time of inferior conjunction. This is the point uh, at which the planet if this was a transiting system, would pass um, in between the Earth and the star. And also some other parameters that would define the eccentricity of the orbit. And then lastly, this is the uh, radial velocity semi-amplitude. It's also used, uh, we use the symbol K most of the time to, to uh, label this parameter. Um, and that is like, you can imagine the height of the sine wave in this cartoon. Okay, so uh, this will be our initial model. Uh, we're going to use the period from our periodogram analysis as an initial guess. Um, we're cheating a little bit here because uh, this system, K224, uh, is known to be transiting. So we sort of know what the time of, in we already know what the time of inferior conjunction is. So we're going to use that here, but um, you could equivalently uh, make a guess and then use some sort of Y prior on it. Um, and we're also going to make a guess about uh, some other parameters. These are uh, possible longer term trends uh, that we might observe in the data, specifically uh, any curvature to the data, like a quad quadratic uh, term in our model, as well as a linear uh, trend. Okay. And so let's see, uh, these are also instrumental parameters. You'll see this a lot in radial velocity analysis. Each instrument, each spectrograph that's used to collect radial velocity data uh, will, will need a different um, offset term and a different, uh, we call it a jitter term. And this, the jitter term kind of uh, encapsulates some of the systematic error and uncertainties uh, that go into observing. Okay. And so, we're going to now plot uh, the model with our initial parameter guesses. Uh, okay, so 
right? Again, this is time on the x-axis, rate of velocity in meters per second on the y. The data is in blue, and the model, our initial guess for it, is in orange. That doesn't look super great. Um, but what we can do is what's called a maximum likelihood fit. And so we're going to generate this uh, Bradville object called a posterior object. Um, and we're going to send it essentially our likelihood object. So this, if you're familiar with Bayesian analysis or Bayesian statistics, this is all, uh, Radville is all built in a Bayesian framework. So um, we defined what our model should be. We defined our likelihood function, some priors. Um, and now we are going to condition our model on the observed data. Okay. Um, and so we are going to, uh, I'm going through this quickly because uh, I want to get as far as possible, but we're going to now uh, optimize our model given the data. And this looks like a much better fit. Okay, cool. So now here is uh, the same plot. Uh, but you can see that our model is kind of snapping to the data once we've optimized all those parameters. Um, and it does, Radvel does come equipped with some fancy uh, built-in plotting tools. Like this, this plot is like a publication ready plot almost. Um, and so here is our time series of data. Here is our uh, quadratic trend and linear trend as well. And then below, this is what's called a phase folded plot of the data. If we take the data and uh, fold it to what we think the period of the planet is, in this case, about 20 days, uh, what is what does the orbit look like? We, For a circular orbit uh, with zero eccentricity, we expect, we'd hope to see a sign curve. Um, yeah, so I think I'm, uh, not going to have time to go into all of uh, the, the rest of the notebook, but it should be uh, fairly self-explanatory. What you're going to do now is uh, another common, kind of common step in radial velocity analysis. Okay, now that we found one signal in the data, maybe there are others hiding in the data as well. So we're going to take the residuals of our model, and we're also uh, we're going to plot them up first. Okay. And then we're going to do our periodogram analysis again. Are there any peaks in the residuals uh, that we haven't identified? Maybe there's one at about 55 days. Uh, and then we'll add a second planet to our model, optimize it, and see how it goes. Um, yeah, the last, last section of uh, this notebook is potentially the most exciting. It's or, or the coolest. I, I think it's really cool, Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is, um, you'll notice in these fancy plots that Brad Bell generated for us. Uh, okay, it says we have a planet at 20 days. The amplitude is five and a half meters per second and the eccentricity is 0.4, uh, but there's no error bars on any of those numbers. So uh, in science, we always, always, always wanna be able to, if we, if we give an estimate of a number or a parameter, a physical parameter, we want to report also our confidence on that parameter. And the way we do that in many cases in a Bayesian framework is with a technique called Mon uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So um, yeah, there are, this is also covered in some of the uh, background material and it should be, the code should be fairly ready to run out of the box. So um, yeah, I definitely encourage you to download the notebook and, and give this a try on your own. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time. So, uh, so with that, I think I'll pass things back to Faye. Thank you so much, Joey. It's always great to see K224. That's a most amazing system from K2. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to our second speaker, Shub, who's going to show us the, well, who's going to tell us about the reading from last week and direct imaging of exoplanets in general. Uh, yeah. So I'm uh, going to hold up that you all have it sometimes to look at this paper. Uh, but that first sort of like a review article 
uh, but like a much more smaller like where we are sort of in the community on the project goal uh, for direct financing. It is uh, this paper is set from 2018, so we have definitely like progressed from that. Um, and my presentation is going to be sort of like referring to this paper now and then, but it's more of a general, as they said, a general overview of what direct financing is. Um, and why it's useful and why we care about it. And then we'll be talking about uh, the kind of cool things you can do with direct imaging uh, in the world of, like, in this decade, as this paper was sort of alluding to uh, what the future of direct imaging is like with um, large telescopes like the Shinya Telescope Program or GWST. Um, so, a quick run through of my talk. Um, I'm going to be starting with a big picture, sort of a quick overview um, of the field. Um, and I want to do this by talking about the astronomy behavioral survey. Uh, we'll go into what exoplanets are and the history of detection, which I'm guessing has been covered in a whole lot of detail in the last one and a half months. So we'll be quickly going through that. Uh, I wanted to talk. Uh, give everyone like a small primer about what spectrums are and what spectroscopy is. Uh, so I'm going to do that quickly. And then we're going to get into the crux of the material, which is what the direct imaging method is, uh, what its past achievements are, and what the new by future of the field is. Um, so let's begin. So the astronomy and astrophysics technical survey is essentially a time every 10 years where Astronomers from around the United States recommend the goals of the community for the next 10 years. So it's kind of um, uh, embodiment of astronomers from professionals from around the country coming together, deciding what their field uh, should focus on for the next few years. And these sort of recommendations are encapsulated in a final technical survey. Um, that goes on to influence uh, how funding is allotted for the next 10 years, what like large programs funding is allotted. Um, so past programs that have been like funded by past technical surveys uh, include the extremely large telescope program, which includes mm -hmm. both two large telescopes. Um, so you can do as large, uh, extremely large telescopes. And I believe the 2010, uh, well, it's very older technical survey uh, talked about the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, as we know now, a reality. Um, talking about the Astro 2020 technical survey, the technical survey that happened, uh, it, whose report was released last year, uh, it listed three top priorities for American astronomy for this decade. And one of the three is worlds and suns in conflicts. Uh, the idea being that we want to study worlds uh, and since we want to do exoplanetary science. Uh, as this article for Scientific American was a uh, hunt for alien life of next generation, which was with this astronomy. So that includes <coughs> planning for how to do good exoplanetary science in the future using space telescopes and the extremely large telescope program as they come on. Um, with that said, uh, the idea that I'm trying to motivate is that right now, as a lot of the artists is happening as we speak, uh, and it is one of the top priorities of American astronomy for this and possibly the next step. Um, with that being said, let's talk quickly about what exoplanets are. Exoplanets are non stellar astronomical bodies, which is the means of planet, doesn't have side or solar system, they are usually found out with the another uh, star. They have been found just not in orbit or not gravitationally bound to any other uh, body, so like three quarters. Um, the first exoplanets were discovered in the 1990s, as you may have heard before, the first planetary system was found around the pole star, uh, and the first <coughs> planetary system around the solar system. Uh, type star was found uh, later in the same decade, for which came about Paris two years ago, was a lot of Hypermere and Pismos. Um, 
And now through extensive surveys, we have detected close to 5,000. Actually, this figure is so, so now we have detected over 5,000 uh, exoplanets detected and confirmed. And out of these exoplanets, most of them are large uh, <coughs> gas giants or beyond that plants with a few terrestrial plants uh, in here. Uh, with that, I want to quickly talk about what spectroscopy is um, to just get uh, everyone on the same page because I will be talking a lot about our spectroscopy uh, with direct imaging. So the idea of spectroscopy is that you can take a picture in various different colors by using different colors. Colors basically correspond to different variants of light. So in this case, uh, if you take the picture of a leaf and you see two different colors, uh, if you keep everything else the same, we would see brighter uh, than the red or blue, just because uh, most of the light that's reflected off the leaf uh, is supposed to be blue. Um, if you do this at close enough wavelengths, uh, you can sort of plot the brightness of <coughs> what you're seeing at all of these wavelengths. They're all of these different colors. So here you see a reflected spectrum of a leaf. Uh, which is essentially, as you can see, it sort of peaks in the red and the green, which is which makes sense because we see that leaves are green and not blue, so they're absorbing most of the blue light. Uh, the reason this is useful is that these sort of spectrums or these sort of uh, behavior of the intensity of light with at different colors is different for different compounds. So, for example, for uh, the two different kinds of chlorophyll, both of them absorb uh, the least amount in green, but they absorb different proportions of red. So by looking at how these things are behaving, you can try to figure out uh, what kind of compounds are present in a leaf or in others. And so the reason spectroscopy is interesting is because uh, when you look at light from far away objects, say stars or say planets, then you can look at their absorption spectra or uh, kind of essentially what particular colors or wavelengths of light are absent from their spectrum. Um, and this, these absorption spectrum are unique for different wavelengths. So for example, if there were hydrogen in the atmosphere of a gas giant and we were able to look at it directly, or if there is hydrogen in our sun and we look at the spectrum of the sun, we would see some bits or uh, we would see these colors absent from its spectrum. And from that, we can sort of reverse engineer fingerprints uh, to figure out what kind of elements or what is actually present in these faraway objects, which encapsulates the powers of the um, That let's go back to exoplanet detection. Um, so on the left hand side here, I have this sort of shift that is auto populating based on uh, the year uh, different planets were uh, detected. On the <coughs> y axis, on this vertical axis, I have the mass of exoplanets. Oh, mass of the exoplanets. Uh, on the x axis, I have the distance from their whole star, um, or correspondingly, what one year corresponds to. Uh, for that planet. And as you can see here, like these different colors, uh, each dot corresponds to a different planet, and the color of the dot corresponds to the detection technique. Uh, so we're going to like uh, look at these specific um, dark brown dots that are coming up here, which correspond to the direct imaging uh, detection technique. So these uh, darker uh, dots, dark red dots, here are plants that were detected using the direct imaging method. Uh, the idea of the direct imaging method is instead of, uh, say, the Ray the Rusty method, which we talked about today, or the transit method, which looks at uh, light emitted by the star and tries to figure out if there are any um, effects on that star, like because of the presence of plant, for example, in the Ray the Rusty method, you have the spectral lens that are going through a cycle. Due to the Doppler shift, uh, we instead of looking at starlight, we look at light that is directly emitted by an exoplanet, uh, which makes it very powerful for <coughs> being able to uh, characterize these exoplanets. This works. 
uh, dark mode missions just because uh, this planet is very expected to be brighter. And this, this method does not rely on harmful characteristics uh, for detection. The idea being that uh, you don't rely on how the orbit is looking or how it's behaving because you're directly looking at light emitted by a body and not its effect on another light emitted body. Uh, this is sort of uh, possible to infer on this plot. As you can see, uh, we have been able to directly image exoplanets that have periods uh, that go up to 100,000 or even 10,000 years. Uh, and this is not possible with, say, an indirect method because we haven't been observing those systems for long enough for us to actually be able to see uh, one hourly cycle or one uh, or a few chances to be credibly able to make. So, um, the next plot I have here uh, is supposed to really draw from the idea of the power of direct imaging, spectroscopy with direct imaging. Uh, so this is essentially showing you, showing you the same plot as before, uh, different uh, structures and different planets that we have detected, uh, with different shapes and colors representing um, different detection techniques just in here. Uh, the bold planets, the bold dots, are the ones that we have been able to characterize. So essentially, we have been able to characterize the atmospheres of these bold planets. Uh, you can do that in two main methods. One is transit spectroscopy, where you try to look at what the absorption spectra uh, of a <laughs> exoplanetary atmosphere is as it transits in front of your stars and try to look at sunlight that passes through um, <coughs> the planetary atmosphere and try to see what happens in that light uh, due to the effects of that. We do direct energy spectroscopy, which is essentially looking at light coming directly from the planet and trying to see uh, the kind of spectral features and the right thing for uh, what is present on the planet, as well as other things you can figure out, say, the velocity of the planet or how fast it's spinning or what its effective temperature is. Uh, based on various theoretical models of how those things behave and the expectations. Uh, the idea here that I really want to draw on that is also alluded to by the paper itself in one of its figures is uh, as you get direct imaging uh, more sensitive, closer and closer uh, to a whole search, so going leftward on this plot, uh, that's where the real power of that image is. As you can see, this region here is sort of disjoint with these high density regions, um, radial velocity surveys, the uh, triangles here have shown us that the population of gas giants sort of um, <coughs> maximizes in this region. And you can see that that imaging isn't enough claim to be as sensitive as these lower separations uh, as we would hope to it to be. So getting that imaging to be sensitive closer into storage um, is a really something we aspire to do just so that we're able to characterize all of these uh, large populations of gas giants and other moments of um, Because characterizing the monster gives us a lot more information about uh, these plants than in their um, So why are we not able to go closer? What's stopping this? It's on the other, but other techniques actually can even work better at the situations to not direct imaging. The idea there is simply that planet light is expected to be or is a much, much, much fainter. Uh, so typically, consider Earth like planets, they are typically a billion times fainter um, than um, some light stars. So if you look at uh, them from far away. Um, that's the chance that direct imaging has been sensitive to are around a million uh, by a factor of a million painter uh, that's occurring like, sensitive to rays. The idea is that like uh, even though these are two different point sources, the sun and the star, uh, sorry, the star and the planet, uh, every single image that we take in astronomy is blurred into some temporal diffraction uh, according to a point spread function. Which is instrument dependence. So the image becomes blurred, and uh, this blurred starlight is also bright enough to hide away a planetary signal somewhere in it because, again, the planet is much fainter 
Uh, we colloquially like to describe this as a far from a spotlight problem. Imagine if you will that there's a far from a spotlight, and you're trying to find uh, the far located on the spotlight, in, which is hidden away in the layer of the spotlight. So we need some techniques to be able to do this. Another thing that uh, makes this even tougher is how far away we are from the uh, this firefly and the spotlight. If you imagine the firefly sitting on the spotlight, uh, to sort of get an idea of the scales, um, we're trying to figure out if there's a firefly sitting on the spotlight while the spotlight is gone, and uh, you're doing this cross country sort of like if you had a lighthouse on the east coast and you're sitting in California, say at Caltech. Uh, which I was when I made this presentation, but it's not okay. Um, you would be sort of trying to find something that close on the sky, so you think that works very well, close them to the stars, as well as something that can image things that high contrast or a high ratio of brightness between these two bodies. Um, so classical direct imaging techniques have been able to do this. Um, the two main techniques that they have used um, include adaptive optics and coronagraphy. Adaptive optics tries to deform telescope mirrors in real time to reduce blurring, as seen in this shift um, from these real galaxy center. Group. As you can see, uh, when you turn on the adaptive optics system, the blurring of starlight uh, becomes good, and coronagraphy involves just blocking away portions of the starlight, as you can see in this picture of our sun. Um, it's called coronagraphy because it was originally used to study the coronas of the sun or the sun's atmosphere, uh, but it can be similarly used uh, in planetary uh, So with that, I'm just going to show you a couple of results that uh, the field has produced over the last couple of decades. Um, this is the HRA 799 system, a very famous direct image system, which shows four uh, massive direct image parts. This was detected in the trend uh, around I guess, 15 years ago now. Uh, and the data on the left hand side here shows you these four planets moving around its full star. Um, through observation from almost a decade uh, from Hawaii. Uh, I have similar pictures of other planets that we've detected around other uh, stars. Uh, as you can see, these <laughs> observations uh, encompass large spans of time, and you can actually see planets orbiting around their planets, uh, orbiting around the Uh, a really cool decent result to the image of the blue disk around the planet, so something, uh, so material that's revolving around the planet in this uh, Alma image. Um, going forward, talking about the near Venturster, which the paper was also uh, talking a lot about, but from the perspective of four years ago, it's really cool to see that we're actually four years ahead of the time, ahead of the time the paper was written from to see how we will actually been able to get to things like the JWST or some of the instruments that I mentioned in the paper uh, and how the ELT started working. So with the JWST just launched uh, last year, um, uh, we have instruments like the nerve stick and nerve cam on it uh, that can do uh, direct imaging. We have a uh, coronagraph on the JWST too. And the first 13 discretionary programs that uh, have been collecting data for the first sort of uh, pre science cycle. Uh, two of them focus on uh, planets and planet formation. One of them are uh, looking at transit as the planets, and the other one sort of doing high contrast imaging, which is just that. Um, yeah, with that, I'm going to end when you want to do it. So, if you have any questions, keep an eye on the PLT. Yeah, thank you so much, Shub. It's always amazing to see the planet moving real time in movies. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to the final topic today, which is the final project for this workshop. Uh, sorry, that's not the correct slide.
All right, I am the speaker uh, for this part. Um, time flies, everyone. Um, we are almost at the end of our workshop this year. And uh, let me introduce you to the final project, which is writing your very first research proposal. So what exactly is a research proposal, you may ask? Well, writing a successful proposal is an integral part of your scientific career. As everything else in society, the funding and other resources in astronomy is limited. So these resources are usually given to scientists who can write compelling, innovative, and detailed research proposals. In a good research proposal, you first of all identify some gaps of knowledge in a particular field, and you try to come up with a new idea to, that try to advance the field forward. Then you lay out a detailed plan to carry out the necessary observation or experiment or modeling to put your new idea to t further test. And you have to convince the reader that your project is worthwhile, timely, and feasible. We believe writing a proposal would be a great chance for you to synthesize all the different skills you have picked up in this workshop, including literature review, critical thinking, latex, and overleaf writing. Right. To get you started, we suggest that you take a look at some example research proposals. Here's a list of funded NSF proposals compiled by Alex Lam. Note, uh, these were prepared by undergrad students as well as first or second year graduate students rather than professors. So you should be able to read these proposals with no problem. And in the near future, you may have to write one such proposal yourself. So the proposals listed here span a range of different disciplines from chemistry, biology, to engineering. But the general structure and the tone of language used in these proposals should be quite universal. So feel free to take a look at them before you write your own proposal. I'll share this link uh, on our course website. All right, after reading a few example proposals, you should have a good feel of what a good proposal entails. The next step is to pick a topic that you are really interested in. Here's a list of topics of hot ongoing research in exoplanets, including atmosphere formation, dynamics, astrobiology, the origin of life, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, transit radio velocity imaging. We have talked about a lot of these during our pre previous sections, sessions. So feel free to pick a topic here or if you have other interests, you can also write a proposal on those, including maybe gravitational wave, comets, the interstellar interlopers, uh, solar system exploration, you name it. Once you have a topic in mind, um, you should head over to NASA ADS and try to look for relevant papers on your topic. You should search uh, you should search the keywords uh, just uh, as a top uh, in the topic. And if you know there are particular authors who work on this view, you can also search by the author's first na uh, last name. Once you have some search result, you can prioritize them uh, using the impact parameter, which is another word for how much citation that paper has received over time. And you should pick out a few papers from that list and review these papers carefully, particularly the discussion and conclusion section, where the authors have already identified some weaknesses or limitations in their current work. And the next step is for you to come up with a new project or new idea to address those gaps of knowledge. To make things concrete, you can think about what are the upcoming missions, for example, how does James Webb Space Telescope or the TESS mission or the Gaia mission improve the status of the field? How does the improved precision or the much larger sample size change the landscape? And you should also think about new techniques such as machine learning. Can you apply some of these techniques which are uh, being widely used in the industry to the scientific problem you have at hand? So in general, you should try to be bold 
and you should definitely look into the future when writing your proposal. Now let's summarize your new idea and write a proposal using LaTeX Overleaf. Here's the link to template proposals on Overleaf. You can scan through them and find a particular template that you really like and start writing. Uh, your proposal should be, it should be at least two pages long. Um, you should probably spend 75% of the proposal trying to summarize the existing knowledge, basically condensation of the papers you have read. And you should spend the next 25% laying out your new ideas and how you would go about testing your new idea. Uh, please include at least one plot or a table to re reinforce your plotting skills or table making skills. And um, if you don't have the new data, you can feel free to use existing data in the papers you have read or just generate fake data to illustrate your point. Um, in your proposal, please make sure to cite the papers you have read in the correct format. Doing, uh, doing citations correctly is a very important part of writing a scientific paper. Uh, let's make use of this opportunity to do that. Finally, I want to show an example proposal written by one of our participants from last year. Her idea is to use microlensing to focus radio emission from a nearby exoplanet and hence its detectability. You can see that she included a schematic here to demonstrate her idea, and she probably cited a few papers related to the topic. You can see she included a reference section, and the paper is probably cited with the author list, the title of the paper, the name of the journal, and the issue number, etc. Um, she also highlight, highlighted some of her key points in bold form, as you can see in the very last section. Here, in bold form, uh, the readers can know which are your new ideas and they can take a particular, uh, well, pay particular attention to your new idea. All right, um, that's basically it. I hope everyone will have fun in this proposal writing exercise. There's no fixed deadline, but if you can submit to us before the end of the workshop next week, we'll be able to provide you with some feedback. And if you, if you like it, you can post your proposal on piazza.com for other participants to take a look. If you don't feel like it, you, we, you can always directly email um, uh, the mentors, including myself. Uh, and you know our email from the course website. All right. Uh, I think that's it for this week. Before we end, let me just remind everyone to take a look uh, the assignments and additional resources on the course website. And next week, we'll meet again on Monday, and that'll be the final section for this workshop. Uh, we will discuss the very important topic of how to look for a funded summer research program, which hopefully you'll get for next summer and really get your career in science started. Moreover, next week, we will invite everyone to join us on Zoom for general discussion or Q&A. We'll share the Zoom link on piazza.com and as well as on uh, the Google group. So take care, everyone. We'll see all of you next week.